Hey everyone, Happy New Year and welcome to our first video of 2020. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing Blackmagic Design's Editor Keyboard, which was introduced in April of last year along with DaVinci Resolve 16. Now, because of the holidays, I've had a few days to play with it and I wanted to give you my impressions. And I was a bit skeptical at first. I mean, I'm pretty fast with the keyboard and mouse. I mean, how much faster could this thing be? Well, to my surprise, it really blew me away, especially when using it in the cut page. Now, to be clear, you can use it in the edit page, but when using it in the cut page, it works on a whole different level. And as you'll see, using this keyboard, you can make your edits simply based on the proximity of your playhead to an edit point. And that's what makes this keyboard really fast. Before we jump into the software, I should point out that this is not going to be a tutorial on how to use a cut page. I have a dedicated six hour tutorial on my website called DaVinci Resolve 16 Core Training, where you'll learn how to become fluent in the use of the cut page along with all the other pages that are part of the Resolve experience. So let's take a quick look at the keyboard layout. The middle section of the keyboard is a standard QWERTY layout with colored key groupings based on common editorial functions. Green keys for clip navigation, light gray keys for trimming, cream colored keys for marking clips, and so on. In the upper left are a group of six keys that are dedicated to performing editing functions in the cut page, which include Smart Insert, Append, Ripple Overwrite, Close Up, Place on Top, and Source Overwrite Edits. These keys correspond to the tools found in the toolbar below the media pool and the cut page. Directly below those keys are two cream colored keys for marking in and out points and six black keys for performing trim operations using the search dial on the right side of the keyboard. The three light gray keys are for adding and removing transitions. These keys correspond to these buttons in the lower right of the media browser. The row of keys along the top are function keys that are mapped directly to common editing commands such as freeze frames, picture in picture effects, and insert edits to name just a few. At the heart of the editor keyboard is the search dial and it's hands down the best thing about using this keyboard. It has a solid weighty feel that's very responsive to touch. The search dial has three navigation mode buttons, shuttle, jog, and scroll. The two buttons at the top allow you to quickly toggle between the source viewer and the timeline. Depending on what bin is active in the media pool, pressing source will place your viewer into source tape mode, which creates a virtual string out of every clip in the bin. When the shuttle button is selected, you can navigate through a long clip very quickly, depending on how far you turn the dial right or left. The greater rotation from the center position, the faster you can shuttle through a clip. Pressing the jog button will allow you to navigate through your clips with greater precision using the dimple at the top of the wheel. When you're in jog mode, the waveform is also presented as a zoomed in view to help you in locating specific frames based on the audio. Pressing the scroll button places the dial into a geared up jog mode where you can quickly navigate over your clips by seconds rather than frames. I prefer this mode because I can freely spin the wheel in the direction and speed that I want, whereas the shuttle mode has hard end stops. Let's look at how the search dial can be used to perform some editing tasks in the timeline. I'll press the timeline button to bring focus to the timeline clips, then scroll over to this trio of B-roll clips. I want to trim the out point of this first clip. In any other NLE, I would need to select the edit point before I could trim it. But the cut page is all about the proximity of the playhead to the edit point. As I scroll the playhead near an edit point, a white animated arrow appears in the time ruler to indicate which edit point the playhead is closest to. With the playhead near the out point, I'll press and hold the trim out button. The edit point becomes selected. Now I'll just rotate the search dial to trim the edit point in the direction I want it to move. Then release the key to lock in the edit. Let's trim the end point of the next clip. Because of the playhead proximity to the edit point, I don't need to move the playhead. I simply hold down the trim in button, then turn the dial. For the next edit, I want to perform a roll edit. I'll scroll near the edit point, then press and hold the roll button. The visuals indicate that both the A and B side of the edit point are selected but the red bracket on the outgoing clip's edit point is red, indicating that there's no available media handles. I can roll the edit to the left of the dial, but not to the right. But let's say that I need the edit point rolled to the right. In order to make that happen, I'll have to create the media handles with a slip edit. I'll press and hold the slip source key. 
As you can see from the white outline extending out from the left side of the clip, the head of the clip has available media handles, but the tail of the clip does not. Rotating the dial to the right slips the clip earlier in time to give me the tail handles I need to create the roll edit. Now I'll press and hold the roll key and trim the edit point to the right. What's truly amazing is that I haven't had to use my mouse for any of these trim operations. Next, I'll add a transition by scrolling the playhead near the edit point between this rusty car and the old bus, then press the dissolve key. A one second cross dissolve is added to the edit point. I'll play that back. I want to shorten the dissolve just a bit. Again, because my playhead is in proximity to the edit point, I'll press and hold the transition duration button and rotate the search dial to reduce its duration. To use a different transition, press and hold the F4 key to bring up the transition selection window. Now rotate the dial to select any transition. The transition that is selected appears to the right of the orange arrow. I'll go with this oval iris and play that back. If you want to return the edit point to a straight cut, press the cut key. Let's swap the order of these B-roll clips. I'll park the playhead over the clip I want to reposition, then hold down the swap key, which is F6. I'll then rotate the dial until I see a translucent overlay of the clip move forward or backward depending on the direction I want to swap. I want to swap the order of these first two clips. When I see the overlay is in position, I'll release a key. Often during the editing process, you'll want to add or replace clips and otherwise make changes to the clips in the timeline using one of six editing tools in the upper left of the keyboard. Using the bin list drop-down menu, I'll select the B-roll bin containing all my B-roll clips. I want to replace this shot of the rusty car with a shot of the pink Cadillac. With the playhead over the clip I want to replace, and the clip selected in the media pool I want to replace it with, I'll tap the ripple overwrite key. In the cut page, a ripple overwrite is technically a clip substitution operation. If the source clip is longer or shorter in duration than the clip it's replacing, all the clips to the right of the substituted clip will be pulled back or pushed forward to make room for the new clip. Another one of my favorite edits in the cut page is the close-up. If you're working with 4K material in an HD timeline, or an 8K clip in a 4K timeline, the close-up edit will automatically create a 200% punch-in. Using the dial, I'll move the playhead where I want the close-up to start, then press the close-up key. If you're punching into a human subject, the cut page uses face detection to automatically position the face in the center of the frame. If you need to adjust the scale or position of your close-up, you can reveal the tools, then make your adjustments. And while we're parked over this clip, I'm noticing that this car is looking a little washed out to me. I want to quickly auto-balance the shot so that it looks better. In the main keyboard section, I'll locate the red Auto Color button, then tap it. Instantly, my clip is auto-balanced to give it more contrast and saturation. I'll do the same for this bus shot and the wide shot. Another common editing type is the Place on Top Edit. As the name suggests, this edit will place clips above the highest numbered tracks for creating cutaways. These B-roll clips of the vintage footage were added to the timeline using this type of edit. Instead of using the search dial to navigate the timeline, it's often faster to enter absolute timecode values to jump the playhead to exactly where you want it. Using the numeric keypad, I'll enter 53.14 and press return to jump the playhead to 53 seconds and 14 frames. As I jog over the edit point, you can see there's a jump cut that I need to hide using a B-roll clip. I'll jog back a few seconds to roughly 51 seconds, then press the I key to mark an endpoint. In the Resolve 16.1.2 update, a new UI feature was added. Whenever an endpoint is marked in the timeline, an orange animated arrow appears in the time ruler to indicate that the marked endpoint now has priority over the actual edit point, indicated by the white arrow. I'll mark an out point just beyond the jump cut by jogging to the right and press the O key. In the media browser, I'll select this old building clip. However, you'll notice there's a music note icon in the lower left of the thumbnail to indicate that this clip contains audio. I'm only interested in using the video for this edit. Pressing F7 will enable a video-only edit. Notice that when this key is pressed, the video-only icon becomes highlighted in the upper left of the timeline, and if I press F8, the audio-only icon becomes highlighted, indicating an audio-only edit. These icons were recently added in the 16.12 update, and they're super helpful. 
I'll press F7, then press the Place on Top key. The clip is added to the V2 track above V1 while honoring the in and out points I set. So how does this keyboard perform in the edit page? Let's take a quick look. I'll jump over to the edit page where I can see my clips in a conventional timeline. I'll jog over to an edit point then press the Trim Out button. The out point is selected that is closest to the playhead. I can then trim the clip using the search dial, just like in the cut page. But the trim behaviors are slightly different. For example, the default trim mode in the edit page is an override operation, which creates gaps in the timeline or overwrites adjacent clips. If you wish to perform a ripple trim like in the cut page, you'll need to press the T key to enable the trim edit mode so that when you trim using the button and dial, a ripple trim will be performed instead. So in the edit page, there are a few more steps in some cases. With the playhead near the edit point, you can also press the dissolve button to add a cross dissolve and adjust its duration. In fact, most of the shortcut keys work just fine in the edit page, but a few of them are cut page only commands like this sync bin button, which leads me to the next feature I wanna show you that really demonstrates the power of this keyboard when it comes to multicam editing. Let's jump back into the cut page. What I'm gonna do first is go to the master bin and create a new timeline. I'll name it Multicam and press return. From the bins list, I'll select the Multicam bin. This bin contains two angles of an interview, a wide shot and a close up. Before I can work with them, they need to be synchronized. I'll click the Sync Clips button, then click the Audio button to synchronize them by audio waveform, then click the Sync button. Once the clips are synced, I'll click the Save Sync button. Clips that have been synced appear with a sync badge in the upper corner of the thumbnail. In the bin, I'll select the Wide Shot and press the Append button to add it to my timeline. Now it's all keyboard editing from here on out. I'll press the F1 Sync Bin button. This key activates the Sync Bin panel where I can see my Wide Shot and Close Up angles stacked in numbered angles. The Wide Shot in Angle 1, and the close-up in angle two. The synced angles also appear in the multi-viewer to the right. Notice as I jog over the clip in the timeline, the sync bin's playhead is in perfect synchronization with it. So all I need to do is decide when and where I want to cut to the close-up. I'll play the clip until the subject mentions the year 1979. And in 1979, this is where I want to make my cut. To cut to the close-up, I'll press and hold the two key, then rotate the search dial to determine how much of the close-up angle I want to use then release the key to lock in the edit. I'll then jog further into the timeline clip, looking for another place to cut to the close-up. When I want to cut again, I'll press and hold the two key, then use the dial to adjust the out point. To get out of the sync bin, press the timeline key, then play back. And in 1979, there was a major storm that revealed one of the planes. And that plane uh, has given us tons if at any point I want to trim these B angles, I just move the playhead in proximity to the edit point I want to adjust, then hold either the Trim In button or Trim Out button to adjust the edit point using the search dial. So let me summarize my thoughts on this keyboard so you can determine if it's right for you. First, I'm very impressed with the quality of this hardware. It's ruggedly built and it's heavy. It's designed to be a relatively permanent fixture in front of your monitor. Secondly, it's plug and play. To get it up and running, I plug the provided USB-C cable directly to my iMac Pro, launch Resolve, and it worked flawlessly. If you primarily edit in the cut page or the edit page, this keyboard was designed to save you a ton of mouse clicks. And over time, that could add up to hours of time saved. But on the negative side, the keyboard is very large. It takes up a lot of space on your desktop. And it ain't cheap. It's $1,000 US. So whether the cost to benefit ratio is attractive to you is largely dependent on how much you edit and resolve. If you're the occasional editor, perhaps not. But if you're editing day in and day out with resolve, I think the time saved will more than justify the expense of this keyboard. So all in all, it's an impressive piece of hardware that Blackmagic Design is known for. I would love to hear your thoughts. Please post them in the comments below. And if you like what we do on this channel, please subscribe and click the bell. We'll see you next time.